Hey, what's going on, everybody? Um, it is Saturday, June 6, 2020. Uh, we're three days away from another election um, here in Metro Atlanta. It is a primary election. And the person I'm talking to right now is uh, Barrington Martin II. Um, yes. He is actually running uh, for position as well. He's actually running for the 5th District position, uh, which you guys may know is John Lewis's position if you live here in Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second, but I'm going to make sure that Barron introduce, Barrington introduces himself. Um, he's a candidate here in Atlanta. He's representing a wave of new and young people who are into politics and people who see that it's their time to step up. They're not necessarily waiting for the gatekeepers to open up. They're not necessarily waiting for their turn. They see a problem and they're trying to address it. So I'm really glad that he was able to talk to me today. And from there, I'll let him uh, continue more on who he is. So Barrington, if you don't mind. How are you guys doing today? My name is Barrington Martin II. I'm born and raised from Atlanta, Georgia. I've been here all my life. I grew up on the west side, um, zone one. If you don't guys, you guys don't know what that is. That's the Grove Park area. Um, I spent my time learning how to play basketball. The reason I'm saying this is because I moved to the east side. My middle and high school careers went to Cedar Grove High School, played high school basketball there. Ended up playing uh, basketball at a D2 school in Missouri until I transferred uh, back down here to Georgia State. And um, didn't play basketball anymore, really didn't care about it like that <laughs> at all. And um, ended up getting my degree in political science. I currently am um, an um, elementary school educator, special ed at um, uh, McNair Discovery Learning Academy. And um, also I'm in Georgia State right now getting my master's degree in African American Studies, but I took a break from that to pursue um, the, this congressional, the fifth congressional seat in Georgia, and here we are. All right. And so for people who don't know uh, right now, can you explain to people why the fifth congressional seat is such a, a well-known seat for a lot of people? Yes, the fifth congressional seat, especially in the state, well, I would say probably nationwide is because of who has that seat. And the man that has that seat is the legendary civil rights icon, John Lewis. And um, let me even start by saying that without John Lewis, there would not be um, a bearing to Martin II because, of course, he paved the way. However, he's been in office for 33 years now. And in my opinion, and as well as looking at the stats and the facts of the situation or the, what's surrounding the district, it's just basically time for a new direction. And, you know, a lot of our leaders here that are already in office haven't stepped up. So it's time for, you know, a new direction, a new change. And that's why I'm here. That's why I decided uh, to run for Congress be amongst um, so many other reasons. Right. And so I want to just ask uh, clear because some people may have some confusion. Is John Lewis still running for his seat or, you, or this is all new candidates? No, he's actually, he's actually running. Um, that's just, the primary is just him and I, just us two. He um, okay. wants to start his 34th, um, excuse me, 17th term. He, his first term was uh, January 3rd, 1987. That's when his first day of his first term. I was born April 3rd, 1988. So he's been in office as long as I've been alive. And, um, you know, civil rights icon, of course. However, again, you know, I feel like the district has been stagnant for 33 years. When you look at the statistics specifically, Atlanta is a 60% uh, black district. However, the district is, um, I'm sorry, city. However, the district is in 30% in poverty. And based on um, the challenges that are on the horizon, that number is going to increase if we're not proactive in um, changing a lot of the things that need to be changed um, within a district. Okay. And so one of those things uh, you talk about changing is one of the things you've I'm surprised I haven't seen an Atlanta candidate really mention this so far, which is a universal guaranteed income. And can you explain to people what that is and, and why you took that position? I took that position because we, we now live in a time where there's so much abundance in our nation and there's so much abundance um, pretty much based on our economy and based on um, the technological innovations that are present right now. For example, um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the reports that stated that, you know, Jeff Bezos is going to be the first trainer. And so if this, um, this you know man is able to accumulate that much capital in such a short amount of time over a span of two decades we should start you know looking for new solutions to you know get people out of poverty 
one of the biggest issues in my district, in the city specifically, is homelessness and poverty. And I feel that, you know, we have to um, embark on a new social contract with each other and just establish the fact that no human being should ever live near the poverty line. So basically, universal guaranteed income is an ideology that was um, brought to the forefront of the political arena currently by Andrew Yang. However, it was championed by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his Economic Bill of Rights. So basically, with universal guaranteed income, to me, it's a better um, you know, social welfare safety net than a lot of the uh, safety nets that we have right now. So basically, using Andrew Yang's model, I would also go big, but I'm going to use it, use his model just to um, paint the picture easily. Um, Americans would get every American, no matter what, how much money you make, would get paid um, a thousand dollars a month for the rest of their lives to do with whatever it, what it is that they want to do with it, and. Basically, with that money, I personally feel like you will be able to, um, you know, allow Americans to possess some type of freedom and agency of their own lives. And also on my platform, I pair this with universal health care, and I feel that these two um, policies create the people's bailout in the sense of where it will um, allow people to escape many of the situations that they're in that they you know they didn't decide to be in those situations for example you can, um, a lot of women wouldn't have to be um, within you know uh, negative relationships and a lot of women are in like negative relationships based on money so basically by putting the money back into the people's hands you give them the ultimate agency over their own lives and the ultimate control over their own lives and remove um, their situations from making the necessary decisions they need to make for themselves. Okay. And I'm glad you kind of mentioned that because it gets into one of the other things on your platform. You talk about trickle up economics. Can you explain to people what you mean by that? Okay. So, um, a long time ago, I know, I don't know if everyone's familiar with, um, Ronald Reagan and, you know, his uh, trickle down economics, which never, ever happened, which never was um, a positive, especially to the black community or to the poor community. And so, um, Basically, by putting uh, money and uh, spending power into the American people, you actually promote economic growth and economic prosperity. You know, um, if anything, the coronavirus has taught us that it's not working or it's not jobs that make the uh, economy uh, go forward. It's the circulation of money it's made, uh, that makes the economy go forward. And so by putting money into the people's hands, you've been, you've been getting an upward bound movement that will allow the people at the very bottom to um, you know, move, move upward from a state of poverty or a state of economic disparity. And basically what that will cause a chain of events or a domino effect, which will move everyone else up as well. Okay. And so, I'm glad you talked about this. One of the other things that also I think has been really interesting in terms of what you're trying to do and what you what you've been pushing on is you've also mentioned this notion of term limits. And I think that's very and I think it's very symbolic in a lot of ways, but I also think it's very interesting that you have platform or you essentially put this a part of your platform and you're running against someone who's probably like the longest tenured member of the Georgia Georgia lawmakers at this point, John Lewis, it's probably 33 years. So explain to people why you are pursuing term limits for people and why you in particular thought John Lewis would be the best example to kind of challenge on that notion. Okay, term limits are important because I felt that in um, with my policies, as you, as you read, that I, it, it shouldn't take me more than five terms, which is 10 years to implement these policies. And also I feel that um, without term limits, uh, the democratic process is eroded, essentially. For example, when you look at the stats of um, the median age of Congress, it's like around, uh, you know, late 50s, mid 60s. However, the median age of the United States populace is around like 35 to 38 years old. So right, automatically right there, we see that there's a difference in ideologies right there. So basically you have, your, so basically um, you and I, our generation are being governed by, um, by sometimes people older than our parents or around our parents' age. And they're not up like with the times as far as everything that's going on. So bringing that to my specific race, um, Representative Lewis has been in office for 33 years. That's a long time, especially to have not had any type of distinct change that has moved the district forward. And um, this is, and I feel that even though um, I love um, Congressman Lewis, and you know, again, he was his his work in the civil rights movement was very um, 
integral to me being here and me having, you know, this platform to be able to even speak to you. However, you have to take into to context that what his, the, the majority of his work was done in the civil rights movement, that was 55 years ago. And when you start looking at that congressional record, you start to ask some questions because, um, you know, he stated uh, a while, like a couple of weeks ago, that he's still dealing with the same things he dealt. He, does he still dealing with the same fight? Excuse me, that he dealt with um, 33 years ago when he started in Congress. So that begs the question: Are your um, are your methods not working, or are you not doing your job, or like what's going on? And so with term limits, you um, decrease the need to even have to ask those questions because what happens is, in my opinion, is that when a new generation is ushered in, when you start looking at the population numbers, and you start to see that younger people are starting to be more then it's best that they are best represented within the governing body. And so that's why I believe that term limits was very important um, to my um, platform and mainly because I legitimately think that it's not going to take me long at all for me to do everything that I need to do to push the district forward, to push the nation forward and move on to something else. Okay. And so one of the other things that I know that you've been pretty vocal about, which is not to say a, a, a political issue on a national level, but it is something that every city experiences, which is this issue of gentrification. Yes. And can you talk about what you've been seeing in Atlanta regarding the gentrification and, and what are your ideas around it? Okay. So um, a lot of times in a lot of neighborhoods, and this is why um, I feel that I was very, it's very important that a young man like myself was able to run for Congress because I have skin in the game. And what I mean by that is, in a lot of these communities within the district, I still have family in these communities that are like super un, un, um, underserved. For example, my grandmother still lives in this neighborhood that I grew up in as like um, a, a kid. And what I'm seeing is, it's a, very, it's a neighborhood that um, comp comprises over a lot of elderly people. And so what, what investors are doing is that they're coming into these neighborhoods, they're offering the elderly people like 50, 60 K for their houses. And they're turning around and, and selling these houses for upward to $350,000. So that, that's the type of return they get on, on their money. But the bad part about it is that um, the elderly aren't able to re relocate anywhere because the, 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 um, the prices of housing is too high for them to re relocate anywhere. So they're kind of stuck. And so we're seeing this in a lot of areas around Atlanta that are historically black, that are historically um, like, like a lot of elderly black people. And so um, I think that um, it's a lot of solutions that could be presented, but sometimes we think that, okay, automatically, if there's a housing issue, we want to build more houses. But what happens with that is that it only um, increases the, the property taxes and the prices um, around them. And then a lot of these people are in um, impoverished areas and they can't pay that money. So what I like, it's, it's many um, things that I was thinking about. Um, you know, you have tiny houses, um, basically economical houses, which will allow people to have a nice a nice home but not necessarily have the huge space that a normal home would have but it's still economic sufficient where they will be able to maintain their bills you have um community land trusts where um the, uh, the specific community will own um you know a specific house or specific buildings or specific houses and um you know they would uh, allow someone to come in and move in and um you know keep pri house pr housing prices down like that i think that the city itself has to do um you know more in that regard because what's going to, what's going to happen or what's happening i see is that a lot of um black black atlanteans are being displaced um, because of this and it's one of the, the biggest issues that I'm looking to tackle um, with, you know, with people, housing authorities and people like that. Okay. And so you, in particular, being a native of Atlanta, you are one of a lot of people I've seen this past year who really have just decided they're going to jump into the political realm. And for you, you've jumped into a big one. You didn't go local. You decided to go for a national seat. Uh, why is that? Why would you decide to go national instead of going local first? Because I feel like, well, for one, um, I'm a, I'm a student of the Constitution and I fit all of the criteria of the Constitution. And I think that it's not, it doesn't take rocket science to see the problems that are going on. And you no, know, I get, I, I caught a lot of slack for having the, the not having the experience for um, 
this specific position. And a lot of people say, well, you know, you don't have the experience, but you know, Andrew Young didn't have the experience when he was a congressman. John Lewis didn't have the experience when he became congressman either. But yet still, we entrusted um, these wonderful men um, to the future of our city and our city has made progress, but yet and still, in 33 years in Congress and there's nothing to show for it, I think that, you know, it goes to show that that necessarily, that necessary experience that people think that you have to have, you don't necessarily have to have that experience because I feel that what I'm bringing to the table is unlike any other politician that just presents problems, but I'm, pre I'm presenting solutions to all of these problems that are present um, within the district itself. And so, and not to mention, I felt that um, I've always been competitive. I always, I always know what I wanted to do in life, and I've always um, felt that I would never um, try to, I would never fall short of my goals. And I, and I distinctly feel that in my first year after being elected, I can make a distinct change that the city has never seen before, and that's why I went um, to the to the biggest office that I could possibly, um, you know. Um, what is that word that I can possibly run for? Because I feel that with the problems that are occurring now and the problems that are occurring in the future, there needs to be someone who is, um, re, re, excuse me, ready and willing to carry those heavy loads that a lot of people are afraid to. And I just threw myself in in the game, um, you know, took that leap, and it was really one of the best decisions I've ever made. Okay. And I just want to ask you as well. So June uh, 9th is coming up this Tuesday. Uh, yes. What is something that you want people to know as they go into the booth about you and what you plan to bring to uh, District 5? I think people should understand that they should have to first take a look at what has been happening and then they have to take a look at what hasn't been happening. And I want them to take a look at everything that I'm offering on the table. I'm offering universal guaranteed income, trickle up economics, universal health care, legalizing marijuana, term limits, basically restoring the democratic process back to the people as it should have been all along. Not to mention, let's just take a look at the other, um, the things that are, that are on the table. Um, my opponent is 80 years old with stage four cancer. With everything that's been going on with social justice, with the coronavirus, he cannot um, you know, be vibrant enough to fight the same type of fights or to fight the way he used to fight. And I'm here, um, ready and able to make sure that I do the necessary things, that I step on the toes, that I shake things up on Capitol Hill to let people, to let those um, people know that, you know, it's a younger generation out there that's coming and we're not taking no for an answer and we're not going to sit by and wait for um, them to continue to lead the country down the way that it's going. A lot of, a lot of change in this entire nation is needed now and I feel that I'm one of the leaders of the new school towards that change that we need. Okay. And uh, thank you for taking some time out. So I just wanted to make sure that people know about you. I think there is something else people should know uh, about you and your platform as well is that you are a young man. You're here. You've talked about a lot of things that are important in terms of gentrification, in terms of UBI. And the one of the other things I think you brought up that before we go is that this issue of infrastructure, can you kind of explain to people what you mean by infrastructure and what your plan is? Yeah, so I feel like, again, we, um, we live in um, an innovative uh, life period in which there, like technology is um, you know, constantly changing our lives. I feel that our roads in Atlanta and the district are terrible. And a lot of times, like I say, in the specifically communities that are underserved, you know, they have like basic things um, that, that aren't even like kept up to date. I feel that although I feel MARTA is a very, um, you know, very good um, public transportation service. It could be a bit better. It could be a bit, um, I would say, uh, modernized. We could add, you know, Wi-Fi to it. We could, um, you know, make it more efficient as far as energy is concerned. You know, things of that nature. I feel that um, internet should be like free in public spaces, um, especially in the downtown area. We have the streetcar that a lot of people don't even use. But I feel that if we were to um, you know, wrap that up and also place businesses downtown, like a lot of um, service industry business, because Atlanta makes a lot of its money off the service industry. What we will end up doing is you have that streetcar and those service industries downtown. We would uh, we would totally decrease um, the traffic problem that we have. We would totally decrease the, the, um, the need and the use for vehicles um, or automobiles as well. So I have like 
a solutions man. So I'm, I'm a solutions based. Like a lot of politicians will come and talk to you and tell you what the problem is, but it doesn't take again rocket science to see what the problem is. But it's always about what what type of solutions are you going to provide? And I feel like I, I do that for basically every um, aspect. Okay. And thank you for taking some time out today. And so if people want to donate to your campaign or, or contact you or visit your website, where could they go? Oh, um, go to votethedream.com. But because we're in a pandemic, I am not, um, I don't feel right asking for donations. So all I tell people is I have this um, initiative called Give Me Five Initiative. And if you like anything that I've said, you believe in me, if you believe in my movement, um, I just want you to pass along my information to five people and then make sure each of those five people pass it along to another five people. And that's all I ask. And again, my website is votethedream.com. Okay. Thank you once again. Uh, no, Barrington. Thank you. No, no, thank, thank you, you so for taking that time. Yeah, Barrington Martin II. Uh, here, he is running on this Tuesday upcoming. And if you haven't already, I will have a voter guide listed in the show notes as well to show you how to vote, where to go vote at, and things like that. But remember, if you haven't voted already, you have on Tuesday to vote. Or if you already have your absentee ballot, you can drop it off at a drop box between now and Tuesday by 7 p.m. Anytime between then. All right. So thank you once again, Barrington, for taking out time. If you haven't already, uh, make sure that you check out his website and all of his campaign information. I'll have it listed in the show notes as well. If you like what you heard so far, please sign up at iamkingwilliams.substack.com, iamkingwilliams.substack.com. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on. Sorry about that. No, you're fine.